Thanks, Jeremy. Um, this is a work in progress, actually work in progress for several years. Um, some people might remember that I gave a talk <clears throat> on, on this similar subject at uh, Hebden Bridge a couple of years ago. I haven't been working on it solidly all that time. I uh, drifted off to other things and uh, have just recently come back to it. Um, so there'll be something new even for people who saw the previous talk. Um, the motivating problem in this project is that, uh, like many people, I've been bu building various clusters of Raspberry Pis, and I find that uh, using Ethernet and TCP IP for networking, which, which is just the standard that everybody uses, um, is a bit unwieldy. Um, you end up with, with a, a small, elegant pile of, of uh, Raspberry Pi boards and great big, clunky um, TCP or uh, Ethernet cables connecting them and uh, many layers of, of software that you really don't, don't want. So my initial idea was, well, why not do my own networking, um, building a special purpose uh, network on chip on an FPGA to uh, replace the Ethernet um, switch. So the first prototype, which some of you may have seen before, um, was a cluster of Raspberry Pi Zeros, um, which don't, ha don't even have Ethernet. Um, and uh, an FPGA, an, an Altera Cyclone 2, um, which I bought from China off eBay for about 12 pounds. Um, the Raspberry Pi Zeros cost uh, £4.50, I think. Um, so this cluster of six CPUs, um, the whole thing is about something like £50 pounds of, of expense, which may well be the, the world's cheapest uh, micro or pico supercomputer cluster. Um, now, the frustration of working with this environment is that um, Altera FPGAs require vendor um, closed source tools, which are pretty horrendous to work with. Um, and I also, uh, being a very indecisive person, never really decided exactly what the network should look like inside. So I left the project for a while and uh, recently came back to it with a new platform. Um, now um, I'm using a Black Ice MX board with uh, an ICE40 FPGA on it. Uh, the huge advantage of the ICE40 is that you can use open source FPGA uh, compiler and uh, routing software, Yosis and XPNR. So instead of uh, waiting minutes or hours to turn around a, a one line change to your Verilog and, and get a, a circuit running again, um, it only takes seconds. And that makes a huge difference to productivity and uh, how enjoyable it is uh, to work with. So um, getting back to the original problem, the TCP, uh, e Ethernet is clunky, not just physically, but um, Ethernet generally implies TCP IP um, and all its many layers of headers and uh, um, extra overhead. So if you think of a, a simple numerical algorithm running on a cluster where um, each processor is, is doing a, some sort of iterative work and occasionally exchanging a small amount of data with, the, with its neighbor, um, if that data communication is being done over TCP IP, here's a fairly extreme example of uh, sending 16 bits of data and here are all the extra headers that are required um, just to, to get the data to the, the next door CPU. You have um, uh, Ethernet header in, in yellow here, uh, TCP header, which has all sorts of information about routing, uh, conversations, um, synchronization, um, the IP header with, uh, with routing information, and then finally the tiny little bit of data embedded in, in all that verbose extra stuff. So your your bandwidth is being, in, in this extreme case, is being used up by by header overhead and, uh, and not by the useful data. Um, also, all those extra headers are being created by layers of software. 
So if you think about what's going on in the operating system to transmit that, that 16 bits of data, you've got various layers of uh, TCP driver, IP driver, the Ethernet um, frame construction itself, the Ethernet device driver, which does the actual communication to, to the hardware. And then on the Raspberry Pi, uh, at least prior to Raspberry Pi 4, there's a whole extra layer of or several layers of uh, operating system overhead because the early Raspberry Pi's Ethernet was actually a USB device. So after you go through all the layers of, of uh, uh, TCP IP and Ethernet, you then have the USB Ethernet driver and all the USB subsystem overhead and another uh, hardware driver to access the control the actual USB host. Uh, and these things are all horrendously complicated and do a lot of work, um, as I can attest, because uh, part of porting the Plan 9 operating system to Raspberry Pi required that I had to write uh, a USB host driver for the, uh, the Raspberry Pi. Um, not, not a pretty sight. So it doesn't have to be so complicated. Um, and for an alternative, I went back in history to the 1970s uh, when Ethernet was being developed in the US. Uh, an alternative um, architecture was being developed at Cambridge University here in the UK um, by Morris Wilkes and uh, David Wheeler and various other uh, researchers. Um, we, I think, recognize Wilkes as the uh, originator of the EDSAC computer, but he worked on a lot of other interesting things as well. So the Cambridge ring um, it differs quite a lot in, in the way it operates from Ethernet. Um, the basic idea of Ethernet is, is uh, every computer uh, shouts and uh, hopes that nobody else is shouting at the same time. Uh, if there's a collision, then you have a random uh, retry, and eventually one of the messages get through. Um, a, 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 a ring, on the other hand, is a much more polite um, English way of doing things. We queue up and take our turn. So the ring um, circulates packets round and round the ring from one station to the next. So these little red uh, squares are ring stations each one is connected to a, a client computer. So a computer sends a packet to the ring station. The ring station waits for an empty packet to come round on the ring. Uh, when it gets an empty packet, it puts its data into the packet and marks it as full. Then the packet goes round the ring till it reaches its destination. The receiver then takes the data out of the packet and sends it to its computer and sets an acknowledge bit which goes back to the sender. The sender sees the packet with the acknowledge and knows uh, the receiver uh, has, has received my data, so it empties the packet, which can then be used uh, for the next computer to, to put some data into. That's, that's basically the way uh, a ring architecture works. So compared to the very complicated TCP IP header, a Cambridge ring packet just has um, well, it's a fixed length packet of, of 38 bits, um, 16 bits of data, source and date and destination address eight bits each. So you can address up to 256 um, computers on the ring. And of course, if you want more, you just make a ring of rings um, and then a few bits of control, empty and, and full bits and then acknowledge and, and one bit of parity. So uh, what I've done is to essentially make an analog of the Cambridge ring within an FPGA. So uh, for li little Verilog processes, sending packets round in a circle. Um, because we have um, lots of wires on the FPGA, instead of being a single, a, a simple serial interface, these are actually 16-bit uh, wide channels. Um, and then we use an SPI interface to connect the, ring on, the network on the FPGA to client uh, Raspberry Pis. Um, because the cluster is small and because we can trust our communication to be reliable, 
we can simplify things even more. We don't need the parity bit. We can you have uh, smaller source and destination addresses. And in fact, for to always trying to simplify things, my packets have um, one byte of data and one byte of address and uh, control information. Um, just like the packet is very simple, now the the operating system interface is very simple. Um, because I have intend this to be used for closely coupled communication, we're not sending messages across the continent or around the world, we're just sending to, to a board uh, a centimeter away. So we don't need a lot of, of reduced uh, routing and, uh, and addressing and congestion control and, and retries and all that sort of thing. So the model of using it is very simple. It's just a point-to-point -point, um, device like like on, on Unix and Plan 9 systems. Everything is, is, is a, um, a stream of bytes. So if we want to send, uh, say, read information from another node and echo it all back, we just open the uh, SPI net uh, device 3 for read and write, and we loop reading data and writing it back again. That's all there is to it. And the corresponding OS um, layers are simply uh, a multiplexer, which takes all the, the network uh, device references and shares the interface to the, the SPI interface um, to the, to the on-chip network, and then the actual SPI driver that does the, the handshaking communication. Uh, and finally, um, it, as I was well into this project, it occurred to me that it could be reused for another purpose. Uh, the exact same Verilog processes that are uh, providing the on-chip network for off-chip clients could also be used as a communication fabric for a multi-core uh, system on chip. So instead of talking to external computers, we might have a few RISC-V processors on the same FPGA and use the, uh, the, the ring to communicate. And there, of course, the, um, the interface between the CPU and the network is very simple. Um, basically, it takes one instruction to uh, if if the uh, the ring is memory mapped as a device, takes one instruction um, to to send a, a one byte packet to a given destination. I think yes, that's my last slide. So, uh, any questions? Thank you, Richard. Um, and, uh, great, great to hear the Cambridge ring coming back to life, having um, spent a lot of my PhD hours uh, driving stuff around Cambridge rings. Everything um, old is new again. <laughs> yes. So um, please, um, and uh, yes, all sorts of memories coming back there I can see on the chat. Um, our final talk, to, so thank you, Richard. Um, great stuff. Look forward to seeing it develop. Our 